Hi, everybody. Believe it or not, it's November, and it's time for our next... It's almost the end of November. I, yeah. It's I, almost December. That's true. I, I, yeah, right. Well, I'm trying not to hurry it too much here, but we are well into November, and uh, we are here to give you... Uh, some answers to questions that uh, you've been posing to us throughout the course of this month so far. And uh, those questions come through our YouTube channel, through emails that come to our office, um, any other number of ways. Mm -hmm. I'm Pastor Paul. I'm here with my wife, Sue, and uh, we're going to do our Q&A for you for this month. So we have some good questions this month. I think month. we do. I think some challenging ones, yeah. too. Yeah, and I think when, when I look over the questions, I think sometimes uh, a lot of people feel the same way and maybe don't know how to put it into words yeah. but let's start with the first one this actually just came in just today from our YouTube channel and Taylor asked a really good question if Israel was rejected by the Lord and the covenant was broken by the Israelites many times then why are Christians supporting Israel today you know this this is uh, uh, I think a very valid question at least in the hearts and minds of, of people here's the problem it starts off from a false premise. Uh, Taylor begins to ask the question by saying, if Israel was rejected by the Lord, which brings up the assumption that Israel was rejected by the Lord. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage Taylor and, and other Christians who have thought this way to look up what Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse one, where he, he says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? And then he answers the question, right. by no means. And he even uses himself as an example. He says, I'm a Jew. I am from the tribe of Benjamin. So if God had rejected his people, I shouldn't be here uh, with faith in Jesus Christ. So here's the other part of Taylor's question that is based on a false assumption. He says, if, uh, if they also broke the the covenant if the covenant was broken by the israelites and then he goes on to say you know many times then why should christians be supporting them well here's the problem there are different covenants when he says he says the covenant well yes the mosaic covenant was broken many times by israel the mosaic covenant was this god said here's my law keep my law and I will bless you in the land, all right? Did, did Israel break that covenant? Yeah, ma many times. That should never, however, be the basis of anyone thinking badly of or rejecting Israel because that's not the covenant that counts. The one that counts is the Abrahamic covenant, which uh, cannot be broken because when God made the covenant with Abraham and his descendants, it was a one-sided covenant. Right. And, and Abraham was put into a deep sleep during the cutting of that covenant for a very specific reason. And that is that he couldn't participate in the making of the covenant. God simply made it a one-sided thing. And there were several things God said in that covenant, such as, I will bless you and I will bless those who bless you. Furthermore, I will curse those who curse you. And then he went on to say, and all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. So God made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants called the Abrahamic covenant. That covenant has not been broken because God would have to be the one to break it. Right. And he has not and will not. So the reason we support Israel today is because God made a covenant that is unbreakable with the nation of Israel. And we know that that those who curse Israel will be cursed. And so we just don't want to be on the other side of that. Well, I feel like you could do an entire hour long teaching yeah. on this, but that is a fantastic answer for three minutes. That's great. Uh, here's another big question. Steve wrote and said, why did God create us? And, you know, that's a, probably a natural question. And the Bible never sets out to answer it. I mean, God never reveals in his word any sort of specific reasoning behind creating mankind. Um, we have to basically pull clues from the scripture and and or from what is revealed concerning the uh, attributes and the nature of God. And one of the things we know about God is that he is completely self-sufficient. And what that means is he needs 
nothing. So right away, we have a partial answer to this question. We know that God did not create mankind because of some innate need right. within himself. In other words, he, he didn't say, boy, I just, I'm really lonely, <laughs> or I want some people to kind of, you know, hang out with or something like that. There was none of that going on. So there are obviously other reasons and reasons that for God's own purposes, he chose not to share with us in his uh, word. So th that th that's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. The word doesn't give us uh, an absolute answer to the question. All right. Yeah. We're really bouncing around with questions. Here's the next one from an anonymous uh, asker. Mm -hmm. What are the accepted roles for women in the church? Is it acceptable for women to teach Sunday school or preach in front of the church? The only thing that, that Paul addresses is the issue of a woman taking the authority of teaching in front of men or teaching men. That's the only thing that is specifically addressed. Mm -hmm. We find no reason in the world why a woman couldn't teach a Sunday school class, particularly, you know, with children where, because women are expected to teach in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible even talks about women teaching, you know, even in the Old Testament. Son, pay attention to your mother's teaching right. and so forth. So um, again, the only thing that is forbidden is a woman teaching a man and the reason is, is because that puts her in a position of authority mm -hmm. and headship. And that is a violation of God's purpose within marriage for the man to be the head and the woman to be in a role of submission. And so if, if she were to get up in church and to teach men, that would be a, a reversal. Of, now, just to clarify, when yeah. you and I hear the term, the phrase Sunday school, we think of children's ministry yeah, because true. in our culture, we don't have adult Sunday school classes. So let me just clarify. Yeah. What about a woman leading or teaching in an adult Sunday school or small group mixed adult mixed gender situation? Yeah, I think I think the Apostle Paul's statement about a woman not teaching or having authority over a man would apply to any okay. sort of a setting. Sunday school, Sunday morning. Wednesday night doesn't really matter. Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sarah asked, my church has always decorated with nativity props for Christmas. Now a new person in our congregation is saying that the props are considered idols. I would like to hear your thoughts. I've never looked at it that way. Is it causing, it is causing strife in our church. And thank you. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, here's the interesting thing about all of the um, Christmas trappings <laughs> and so forth that are considered to be um part of idol worship or pagan worship, nobody would come to that conclusion without someone telling them that those things right. are pagan. The, it, it, you know, you don't, you don't look at like a Christmas tree or decorations or, you know, candy canes or something like that and just naturally go, that's idolatry. <laughs> it, it just doesn't happen. Um, so I would encourage Sarah to, to, to first of all walk in understanding toward this person from the standpoint that they've been influenced and they've mm -hmm. been influenced negatively and they've been influenced erroneously. In other words, they've been given error in their, in their thinking. And now they've been convinced that any Christmas trappings uh, have to do with some sort of expression of idol worship. And, and they, they don't, they don't have anything to do with it. Uh, we are celebrating, we, and I'd say Christians, we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's what they mean for us. And so, you know, to just, to just simply say that something is, is, an, is part of idol worship mm -hmm. is ridiculous. It's, well, think of it this way. In, in, in pagan belief, the sun was, a, there was a God that ruled right. the sun. Okay. So if you go out and um, you decide to do a little sunbathing, I could say to you, you're worshiping. That's idol worship. Well, that makes about as much sense right. as taking Christmas trappings and saying, you're, this is idol worship or mm -hmm. involved in idolatry. It's ridiculous. And it has no basis in fact. Kathy said, are we supposed to pray for the dead like Catholics and Mormons? If we don't know if they are saved, should we pray for them to be saved? You know, the Bible says that um, after death comes judgment. 
And so in, in the book of Hebrews, so n there's nothing in the Bible that would even hint at the idea that we should pray for those who are departed. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus told a story in the book of Luke where two individuals died and there was an immediate place where they went. Uh, depending on the kind of a life they lived and and their faith level and so forth during this life. So, you know, everything that we see in the word uh, would would say, no, there's there's no praying for departed individuals. All right. So Grant from Central Florida greeted us saying hello, Pastor Paul and Miss Sue. And I just have to say here first, I don't think I've ever read that before. And after watching The Blind and they call her Miss Kay, I love that. So I just feel really <laughs> special that he called me Miss Sue. Because you don't get called Miss Sue very <laughs> no, often. No, no, once in a while. But yeah. anyway, he said, I've been listening to your sermons for almost five years now and have gained much insight on God's love for us. I would like to do a deeper study of end times. Other than Daniel and Revelation, which books would you recommend to dive into? I would recommend uh, Ezekiel and Zechariah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just short answer. And, and there's there just some other really good end times. And stuff perhaps in there. Thessalonians would be another. Well, good, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, from a New, New Testament, Testament, yeah, yeah. Balance. Paul mm -hmm. deals in Thessalonians chapter four uh, with the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, catching away of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean said, in light of what has happened in Israel and what is happening in the world in general, where do you believe we are in the end times? Well, I personally believe that we're we're nearing the end of this period of time referred to as the last days. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's only I only say that because it seems like the stage is being set in, in sure. that direction. Um, you know, so, yeah, I, 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 I tend to think that we're toward the end of that time period. You know, the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. And that is obviously true. And I wouldn't even presume to to do any sort of date setting, but it just seems like we're getting close. That, I'll, that's as far as I'll go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Serene or Saren Jackson said, what does, uh, does the Bible prohibit the use of contraceptives? Well, the Bible doesn't mention anything about contraceptives because contraceptives from the standpoint of what we have today didn't exist. Uh, family planning was a much simpler process, <laughs> you know, back in the in in the days when the Bible was being written. The book of John does make reference to uh, children born according to human decision or a husband's, husband's will, will. Mm -hmm. and which tells you that there were people who made a determination to um, to to have a child, to get pregnant and to kind of hold back any. Um, anything they might be doing to keep themselves. I remember years ago, my grandmother, who was born, by the way, in 1900, but I remember my grandmother talking about when she and her husband decided to have a child, and they, she referred to it as throwing caution to the wind. And I thought that that was awfully cute uh, at the time, but, you know, that was, that was kind of life back then. They had right. to be more cautious. Right to keep themselves from getting pregnant. And when they decided to have a baby, it was like, well, okay, here we go. And, <laughs> and there, so no, the Bible does mm -hmm. not prohibit the use of contraceptives. All right. Because that's just family planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next question is which books of the Bible are unknown as to who wrote them? This is always an interesting question when I get it and I get it somewhat regularly and, you know, I always would love to ask the person, why do you care? Yeah. Why do you care if we know or don't know the author's name? There's there's one book in the New Testament, really, that is questionable, and that's the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few other that people, you know, depending on who you talk to, might say this is debatable. In the Old Testament, you know, we're not always sure who wrote. We think we know, but we're not always mm -hmm. sure. Uh, who wrote because sometimes there's no author's name given. And honestly, it doesn't matter. The Bible is the word of God, regardless of who penned the words. And the reason is because we're told in, in the scriptures that the scriptures are, they are themselves God breathed. In other words, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the biblical writers were carried along uh, in their writing. And so it, 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 
it honestly doesn't it doesn't matter as far as which books of the Bible are unknown. I, I didn't take time to nail. You could Google that, I suppose. Sure. You know, um, well, the that, second second part of this question is another hour long message. So yeah. let me hear you do it in three minutes. OK. Without quoting the Bible, how can someone prove the Bible is true without quoting the Bible? OK, first of all, um, it isn't wrong to quote the Bible, to prove that the Bible is true. Even in a court of law, someone uh, can be questioned who is up on trial. Mm. They themselves mm -hmm. can be questioned and that and their answers can be considered part of the evidence as to whatever the case might be about. So, you know, just because you can't, you, you don't have to take the Bible out of the equation, right. but there are other elements of the uh, the scripture and and so forth, um, as far as tr proving the reliability, veracity, historicity of of, of the Bible uh, as being true, and um, those things are prophecy, um, looking back at the geography of of what the Bible talks about, and knowing that those places, many of them still exist by the same name today. Right. Um, historically, being able to prove that these things, mm -hmm. uh, going to other, uh, well, I'm saying unbiblical, or not unbiblical, but extra biblical right. sources to corroborate the history that is laid out in the Bible. There are several ways. I would encourage this person to uh, go to our YouTube channel or on our website and look for the topical series about how, how you can know the, the, the reliability of the Bible. How can you know the Bible is reliable? And there, I did an entire teaching on this. Right. And I think that was over three minutes, but that's okay. <laughs> Sven says, if a person is a believer, but doesn't lead others to get to know Jesus, would they still enter heaven? I feel inadequate in knowing the Bible. I have no doubt that I may be in the future, be more confident to lead, but what would happen if I died today? Okay, Sven, I want you to hear me and I want you to hear me very clearly clearly, okay? Your salvation is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. It is not based on what you do or what you don't do in your life. Now, what you do and what you don't do after getting saved, that will play into the rewards you get or don't get, okay? But your salvation is not and never will be predicated on your performance. It is predicated on Jesus's performance. It's on his work. It's what he did on the cross that saves you. You simply receive that as a gift. But your personal performance does not alter your salvation and cannot threaten your salvation ever. And that's an important thing for believers Very to know. Good. The next question is from India, maybe um, Sunil. I'm truly blessed by your ministry. I've recently listened to your entire Revelation series. Okay. My questions are, number one, who will populate the earth during the millennial kingdom? My friend claims that 144,000 will carry physical bodies, which I can't agree with. I'm not really sure what they mean by that. My mm -hmm. friend claims that 144, the 144,000 are human beings. Um, but who will populate the earth during the millennial kingdom? Now, remember, the millennial kingdom is a 1,000 year period during which Christ will reign on the earth and we will reign with him during that time. Who's going to populate the earth? The, those who populate the earth are those who still have mortal bodies, s those who survived the great tribulation, and the Jews who survived. So whether Jew or Gentile, there will be human beings, mortals, who survived the great tribulation. They will go into the millennial kingdom, right? And they will, over a 1,000-year period of time, repopulate the earth. Okay? okay. All, All right. right. And secondly... Uh, the question is, Jesus's temptations were real, but could Jesus have sinned? Well, <laughs> you know, Satan sure thought there was a possibility. <laughs> Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have brought the temptations that he did to Jesus. We know, however, that Jesus did not possess a sinful nature. So 
you know, I, I personally don't think so, but, um, yeah, I, I, from, from, from my standpoint, from my limited understanding and believe me, it's so limited. <laughs> it doesn't appear like Jesus could have, but mm -hmm. there was something that Satan felt like he could exploit in the human part of Jesus. And, you know, so he sure gave it, you know, his best. Here's from a YouTube viewer, and I'm sure you'll be able to clear this up. If God prohibited consulting ancestors through mediums, why did he allow or make it possible for Samuel to communicate with King Saul? There are people, particularly in the African culture, who claim to consult their ancestors for guidance and protection mm -hmm. against evil spirits. Yeah. And for many of them, result, results of victory can be seen in their lives. Doesn't this contradict what Jesus said in Mark 3, 24? About the uh, kingdom divided against itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, first of all, God did allow uh, Saul mm -hmm. to... Well, I, I don't want to say contact. I'll say this. God allowed Samuel to speak to Saul. Mm -hmm. There happened to be a medium in the room. But if you really read that passage clearly, you will see that that medium was being confronted by something that she had never seen before. And mm -hmm. she freaked out mm -hmm. when she saw the spirit of, of Samuel uh, there in the room. Uh, so this was something that was, this was not your typical sort of a medium right. situation. Um, just for anybody who's tuned in and, and listening to this, a medium is someone who speaks uh, for the dead, who, who consults the dead and allows them to speak through them usually to someone who is living. People go to a medium to consult the dead. This is also referred to as a necromancer. And... Um, this story is in, in the Bible is something that goes way beyond the, the typical form of, of mediums and spiritists and that sort of thing. And, but it is, it is not meant to be a proof text that mediums are real or genuine because they were forbidden in Israel. Right. God said, you must eliminate the mediums from the land. And God even said through Isaiah, when, when, when people tell you to consult mediums, shouldn't you consult your God? Mm -hmm. And so I would say, you know, to, to this individual, first of all, God is very clear in the Old Testament that people are not to consult mediums. Secondly, what God did through Saul through Samuel and Saul was it broke all the rules that was not a, a, a typical medium situation mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. so there's nothing in the Bible that teaches that we should do this now he also mentions in this note that there have been some people who have done this consulted their ancestors for guidance mm -hmm. and there are there they've gotten good results well you know listen mm -hmm. Satan can counterfeit such things and can can even give insights that in the short term are are going to have a positive effect but in the long term you will be bound and his ultimate end is to steal kill and destroy right. and so i would not be i would not be carried away by some idea that this is a successful way uh, 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 or, or a good way of determining guidance or protection against evil spirits because Satan will come back and get you big time. Right. Yeah. All right. Here's another one. Thank you, Pastor Paul and your wife for allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us through you. My question is, what does the Bible instruct us as believers about the age difference between marriage partners? Is there any biblical reference concerning age gap or older or younger? This is a very easy question to answer. The Bible does not mention anything about age difference between marriage partners. Okay. That's then. it. All right. Next question is, do angels have a sinful nature? We don't, we don't know. There's nothing in, in the, the, the Bible that specifically answers that question. We know that angels were given free will. They were given a choice. We know that those who chose to go against God, to go with Satan, were given over to their um, sinful decision and they were literally, they, they literally became demons. 
Um, whether or not that qualifies as a sinful nature, I have my serious, I wouldn't use that term. I think that's unique to human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the next person said, my question is, when do we need to make restitution and when is it not required? Do we need to make restitution for lies, which didn't cause any harm to the other person we lied to? I don't know how you would do that. I don't know how you would do make restitution for a lie. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you lied to someone and the Lord's convicting you af after you've confessed it to him to go to the individual to whom you lied and to ask for forgiveness, then I would do that. But I, I don't think restitution comes into that sort of a situation. Forgiveness, maybe. But the, the main question here is, when do we need to make restitution and when is it not required? Well, we're living, we're not living under the law. Mm -hmm. Under the law, there were <clears throat> rules for yeah, restitution. Right. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, if you stole or hurt or, or broke something that belonged to somebody else, you'd have to return the item and then make restitution beyond that mm -hmm. at times. Um, we're not living under the law. Mm -hmm. We're living under the leading of the Holy Spirit. So if the Lord is leading you to make some kind of restitution for a wrong that was committed, maybe before you were a believer or, or even after, then you should do it, but you should do it by the leading of the Lord. The requirement now is not according to law, it's according to the leading of the spirit. Right, and as parents, if you're talking about children, you know, there are a lot of times when a mom or dad might be, um, it might be really profitable to help your kids make restitution for something they've done wrong. Sure. But, uh, you know, it's if it's profitable, you know, if the Lord shows you to do that, but. Yeah, right. All right, Edwin says uh, in James 5.19, it says, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and brings someone back, here James is talking to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, and the verse tells us that it's possible for a believer to wander from the truth and come back to life in Christ. But a verse in the book of Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, tells us that it's impossible for believers who have fallen away, same as wandered from the truth, to be restored back again. Is not the falling away in the book of Hebrews the same as wandering from the truth in the epistle of James? How do I reconcile both these verses? And I think this is a really good question. Well, it is a good question. Edwin, forgive me, but I can tell you haven't listened to my teaching in Hebrews chapter <laughs> six, because it is not the same thing. Uh, what, what the writer of Hebrews uh, is describing in Hebrews chapter six is not the same thing as wandering away from the truth. What was going on in the, the, the book of Hebrews uh, is the author was addressing Jews who were going back to the law to escape uh, persecution and as a means of being acceptable before God. And that is not wandering away from the truth. James is talking about someone who just, you know, through laziness or, or whatever, they just, they just begin to wander. And, and uh, pretty mm -hmm. soon they're, they're kind of in this wilderness. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that we should, we should bring them back to a place of embracing and understanding the truth. Um, again, Hebrews is talking about a completely different issue where people have rejected the gospel that they once embraced and have gone back to the Mosaic law as a means of being righteous before God. And the apostle Paul makes it clear that that's not possible. No one will be declared righteous, he says in Romans chapter three, mm -hmm. through the law. And so those are completely different different things. And so I don't reconcile them as, as, you know, talking about the same thing at all. So in summary, it would be good if someone, if this question resonates with them to go and listen to those two passages in yeah. your teachings. Yeah. And particularly mm -hmm. the Hebrews chapter six passage, right. uh, because that, I think it clears up a lot there. Tamara says, I recently met a saved woman who told me that some people in her neighborhood were casting spells on her and the ministry that she heads up, causing her to experience extreme sickness. I was always under the impression that we who are in Christ Jesus, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper unless the Lord allows it. Satan can't touch us, right? Can you clear this up for me, please? Well, <laughs> there are so many dynamics here that are unknown. Mm -hmm. First of all, this neighbor says that the, 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 her neighbors are, or this lady says that her neighbors are casting spells and it's causing her to experience sickness. She, that's an assumption. 
how does she know that her sickness is a, is a response sure. mm-hmm. and that and that she's just isn't getting it sick because people get sick you know in this fallen world mm-hmm. so there's an assumption going on here mm-hmm. so so Tamara's question is based a, on a lot of assumption now Concerning this this statement about no weapon formed against you shall prosper. First of all, that was a promise made to Israel in a very unique situation. And that's not something that we can uh, quote and Mm -hmm. claim all the time. Um, However, when it comes to the issue of Satan, there there is a reality here uh, concerning what this person is saying that that Satan must go through the, the Lord. Satan can't indiscriminately touch us unless we have given him a foothold. The Bible, you know, Paul specifically says, I believe it's in Ephesians. I think it's Ephesians. I could be wrong. Could be Galatians. So don't quote me on that. But he says, do not give the devil a foothold. Mm-hmm. So obviously he's telling us here that there's things that we can do in disobedience to the Lord that can bring an invitation or a freedom to the enemy to do something, to harass or something in our lives. So we do have to be careful um, because that is a possibility. But under normal circumstances, Satan just can't indiscriminately just, you know, put a whammy on somebody just because he's kind of in a bad mood. Mm -hmm. Uh, As believers, um, we are we are protected. And at the same time, we're told to be careful to sure. watch out for Satan because he wants to take believers out. But that's going to happen primarily as we give him footholds mm-hmm. and believe his lies and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I, again, I think that you need to be careful when when you're dealing with things in the spirit realm to not base your belief system on assumptions. Sure. I think it's, I think it's dangerous. That's very good advice. Richard said, I have a very close friend who was a baptized believer for many years. He took his own life. Is he covered by grace and able to spend eternity in heaven with his Lord and savior? He writes more. I'll finish this. He's suffered a spinal cord injury about 10 years ago and tried pretty much every treatment to improve his pain, including many, many prayers. His nerve pain was increasingly difficult for him, and he just wanted to go home and not be a burden to his wife or daughter. So it's actually a fairly touching situation. Yeah. Yeah. Of suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) You know, we are saved by putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the Mm -hmm. cross. I know I sound like a broken record when I say Mm -hmm. that, but I'm going to keep repeating it until it gets through people's hearts. We are saved by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. God knows what this man was going through. Mm -hmm. God knows what was going through his heart and mind at that time when he took his own life. God knows. And God, Mm -hmm. I trust that God, you know, will take care of this situation and do exactly what's right. But I am not going to give an inch on this whole idea that I put my faith in Jesus. I believe he died for me, but then I did something wrong and now I'm no longer saved. I'm not going to go there because that that brings it all back to salvation by works. Right. And I'm and that is a contradiction of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. And so. I'm not going to be now. I there are Christians who will say, oh, yeah, this guy's going to hell. And they'll just, that's it. He took his own life. He's going to hell. He's a murderer. He murdered himself. Mm-hmm. And they will say that. Mm-hmm. And they're going to have to answer for their, que- for their statement mm-hmm. one day. But um, all I'm going to say is we're saved by grace through faith. This not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And, um, and God knows what was going through that man's heart and mind. Well, I'm holding on to that. That is fantastic. (laughs) Michael says, we love Calvary Chapel and have been following daily for the last three years. My question for Pastor Paul is, we're told that after being released from the Babylonian captivity in 538 BC, the Jewish people never again worshiped pagan idols. In Daniel, we learned that in the period of 175 to 164 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes forced the Jews to worship pagan idols. As the Bible does not contradict itself, there must be something I'm not seeing. Can you please clarify? Well, what we don't see is we don't see the heart. Yeah. And God sees the heart. Um, You know, you can't, you cannot force someone to worship a pagan idol. Mm -hmm. I know what Antiochus Epiphanes did. 
I, I know what he did. But even though people may have gone through the motions to save their own skin, that doesn't mean they worshiped a pagan idol. Right. Worship comes from the heart. Mm-hmm. Okay. When p- prior to the Babylonian captivity, they worshiped pagan idols from the heart. They truly worshiped those idols. Afterwards, after that captivity, they didn't. And what Antiochus Epiphanes did was this outward sort of a demand, you know, that, that did not, cannot affect the heart. I mean, what if, what if the government uh, today told people, you know, you can't worship God anymore. We're not, we're not going to let you. Mm-hmm. And we'll, here's the punishment if you do. Well, they can't stop us from worshiping God mm-hmm. because worship's in the heart. I don't need any externals yeah. to worship God because it's happening in here. By the same token, other externals out here don't affect my worship either. So yeah, that, it, it's, it's not a contradiction it's at all because worship comes from the heart. B.G. said, thank you for helping so many of us understand the Bible. My question, is it biblical for us to repent for the sins of unbelievers while standing in the gap for them? Yeah, it actually is. We see this biblically. We see Nehemiah doing it. We see Daniel doing it. There are, there are biblical examples of, of, now in their case, they were confessing sins on behalf of the nation of Israel. Sure. Um, as God's covenant people. So, you know, it, it, there might be some differences there, but there are some examples of praying and confessing the sins of those who are, in fact, unbelievers. Um, I don't know if I would call it standing in the gap for them. And, and honestly, God hasn't revealed to us all of the details, all of the insights that may come from what, how we, when we confess on behalf sure. of others, you know, um, Job, you know, offered sacrifices for his children, mm-hmm. thinking maybe they did something wrong. So there was, there was some kinds of, I would call it more intercession yeah, uh, than I would anything else probably. Mm-hmm. And it is biblical to intercede for unbelievers. So Jesper Johansson says, I'm a born again, Christian baptized as an infant without full immersion. Mm. My parents were not then born again Christians, but became so later. Yeah. For many years, I've been in doubt and have heard so many explanations on whether I should be baptized again. Am I baptized at all in your opinion? Well, my opinion doesn't matter. So <laughs> I'm not going to answer that part of it. But um, uh, Jasper, I can tell you that um, I had the same experience. I was a baptized as an infant, sprinkle baptized. Mm-hmm. And um, when, I, when I came to the Lord at about age 24, 25, I made the decision to be baptized by immersion as an adult because the Bible knows nothing of infant baptism. It doesn't mention infant baptism. It certainly doesn't mention sprinkle baptism. The word baptize literally means to dunk or to dip and, or to immerse. And so, um, you know, I, I would say pray about it. But if you've come, you know, you say you're a born again Christian. Wonderful. That's glorious. Um, if I were you, I would eliminate your, your quandary by just going ahead and getting baptized now as an adult, mm-hmm. because as a, you know, baptism is an act of obedience, largely on our part. Well, you can't do that as an infant. You're, right. You can't obey and be baptized. So, and frankly, people baptized their children for unbiblical reasons. Mm-hmm. They did it because they believed, many people believe, that it, it guaranteed them a spot in mm-hmm. heaven later on. So I would go ahead and just get, you know, baptized uh, as an adult. It's like, yeah, why not? Yeah. Why not? That's good. Neha asks, what was the sin or yeah, was the sin of Ananias and Sapphira forgivable? In other words, does blatantly lying to the Holy Spirit cost you your salvation, considering they were both in on it and didn't feel any remorse for doing what they did? Yeah, absolutely. The sin of Ananias and Sapphira was forgivable. Um, Our salvation is not dependent on our sins or lack thereof. Uh, it, it, it is predicated upon the work of Jesus on the cross. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just because Ananias and Sapphira 
lost their lives does not mean that they lost their salvation. Paul talks in the book of 1 Corinthians about some people taking communion wrongly, and he said that's why some of you are sick and some have even died. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't mean those people were lost. Don't you think the confusion lies in, like in this case, Ananias and Sapphira, they physically died. Yeah. And the confusion lies in the difference between them physically dying and then what about the spiritual? Yeah. Well, we tend to think of physical death as the end anyway, right. even as mm -hmm. Christians. And so it's like, wow, if they were killed, you know, for something they did, then obviously mm -hmm. they were, you know, unsaved right. or whatever. No, not at all. I, I totally believe that we'll, we'll see Ananias and Sapphira in heaven. Her second question is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Does that happen the moment a person becomes a believer? And if yes, are there verses to substantiate this? I heard a preacher saying that we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. And I'm questioning this. Well, I don't know what that preacher said, and he could have been referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But mm -hmm. yes, uh, we receive the Holy Spirit when we become a believer. If you read through the New Testament, the letters of Paul, you'll see this. He talks about the fact that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, that we receive the Holy Spirit. He comes to indwell us. However, there is another work of the Holy Spirit that God wants to do in the life of the believer, and that is the baptism. And it is something that we, we need to come before the Lord and, and, and receive and open our, our heart to because the baptism of the Spirit is for empowering, whereas the indwelling of the Spirit comes when we put our faith in Jesus, and that is how we were, are born again. And I feel like you covered that really nicely on Sunday, John chapter 20, and that would be maybe a good thing for... Yeah, go back and listen, listen to. to John chapter 20. We mm -hmm. talk a lot about indwelling versus baptism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Irene said, been following you guys for a while now. And my query is about the Israeli and Hamas issue. Is there anything of what is currently happening, a fulfillment of prophecy? Well, I talk about this in a, in a video, a short video that I put on our YouTube channel. And I, I, I said that, no, I don't believe that what is happening currently between Israel and Hamas is uh, an actual fulfillment of prophecy in the sense of some sort of last days you know, prophetic sort of deal. Um, it is an ancient war that is going on. It's an ancient hatred and animosity. And it is part of, I think, wars and rumors of wars that we would experience in this time period known as the last days. Uh, there are some elements of what's happening in the world, however. Uh, I believe that the uh, the rampant anti-Semitism that is, is rearing its head in the world mm -hmm. today is is part of the hatred that we're going to see fulfill prophecy in toward the end of the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. So the next question is uh, a little bit similar. Bonnie said, I have a, I had a discussion with my nephew about end times. His pastor is teaching that there's still one thing that needs to be completed before the rapture happens. We must go make disciples of all nations. This pastor says that the Bible still needs to be translated into hundreds of languages and predicts that will take until 2033 then the rapture could happen i've been taught at my church and i believe i've heard pastor paul say that there's nothing else that needs to be fulfilled and it can happen at any moment yeah yeah um you know we're living in a day and age with the internet and satellite technology where the gospel is getting into the entire world um and uh you know who's to say uh, when, when they say the, the Bible still needs to be translated in hundreds of languages, that assumes that you have to have a Bible in your hand to get saved, which you don't. You know, I was talking to Marigi just today, and he mm -hmm. was telling about how as they share the gospel with people in some of these remote areas, mm -hmm. the gospel is conveyed in stories that are just given orally. And the kind of stories that a mother can retell to her children while she's preparing food and so forth. And these people are so poor, they don't have a Bible, but they've heard the gospel and the Bible and uh, what the Bible says is being propagated through mm -hmm. those people groups. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, the, there are some areas where the Bible still needs to be translated into some languages. But, you know, we also forget, too, that there's a lot of people in the world who are multilingual, mm -hmm. you know. And yes, the Bible m might not be in their language, but that doesn't mean they can't read a Bible or understand it from another language. So I think there's a lot of assumptions going on in this statement that's being 
conveyed. You know, that reminds me when I was in India about 10 years ago, and we stopped at a, a, a village, a really remote village, yeah. and I watched this method of evangelism in person. I just thought it was so brilliant. Our leader, who was Indian, uh, went to the Swami of the village and said, tell me the story of your village. And so he told a story. Now, let me tell you the story of my kingdom. Yeah. And it was his way of leading in, say, yeah. you tell me a story, now I get to tell you a story, because <laughs> I listen politely. Yeah. And I just thought, that is brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. I was very impressed by yeah. that. Creating open doors. Sure. Yeah. Sally said, will unbelievers be in the millennial kingdom? And if so, will they be saved? Um, okay. Once again, you got to remember the millennial kingdom is a period of 1000 years. Mm -hmm. I don't think when the millennial kingdom begins, there will probably be any unbelievers because Jesus, you sure. know, will, this big war will have gone on. Apparently over the course of 1000 years, some will doubt and and there will be unbelief mm -hmm. because we know that at the end of the 1000 year period satan will once again be released and will be allowed to deceive the nations one final time i'm assuming that that he will get a hold of the hearts of those who are unbelievers now the bible doesn't say that specifically it doesn't say and lo there will be unbelievers at right. the end of the mm -hmm. 1000 years it doesn't say that what it says is that satan will get a hold of some people's hearts I'm assuming he'll be able to do that because they have unbelief in their hearts. Mm -hmm. So that's the answer to, that's the best answer I can give you. Sure. David Bond says, first, thank you for your Bible teaching. I have a question regarding 1 Corinthians 12. When our works for the Lord are done out of obligation, will they be wood, hay, and straw consumed by fire? Some days my service to the Lord is out of discipline and other days my heart's filled with joy and a desire to serve. But without those days where my heart isn't involved, I might not reach those days filled with joy in service. Yeah. Um, the, Bible, the Bible doesn't talk about our work at, and whether or not it's joyful or whether it's done out of obligation or what or for or, you know what it what the bible talks about is whether we've been faithful mm -hmm. jesus is going to say well done good and faithful mm -hmm. servant and so the issue is faithfulness and sometimes we do things not because we want to mm -hmm. or we feel all warm inspired. and fuzzy about <laughs> it or inspired we do mm -hmm. it just because we're yeah. being faithful right and that's what god is looking for is faithfulness mm-hmm that's good. Ken and Rhonda Clark said, thank you for your word that my wife and I are enjoy as part of our morning devotions. I have a comment regarding your thoughts on 2 Peter 2, 11 and Jude 8 and 9. I've been trying to get understanding of why the angels caution themselves not to speak wrong of dignitaries, etc. Could it be that all these dignitaries are a part of God's creation and we should not speak wrong or condemn any part of God's creation? I've been thinking that perhaps we need to separate the created from the sin voice, our disapproval of the sin, but not speak evil of the sinner. I would like to receive your thoughts on this. When, when they talk about this, they're talking about spiritual powers. Second Peter 2 and Jude 8, when they talk about angels not speaking um, disrespectfully or, or wrongly of dignitaries, I, I believe that they're making reference to spiritual powers, mm -hmm. spiritual principalities. And it's, it, I, I think that in both of the cases of Peter and Jude, they are responding to what was perhaps a, um, a common or popular thing among the believers at that time. And that was to have an arrogant sort of an attitude mm -hmm. where they're speaking against demonic powers and sure. principalities in a very derogatory way. And these guys are saying, you know, even the angels don't do that. Yeah. You know, so don't don't be arrogant <laughs> and dumb. Just, you know, um, even even when, you know, he, he, I think it's Jude that says, you know, even even the archangel Michael just said, the Lord rebuke you mm -hmm. rather than getting into this long tirade of calling Satan names and speaking arrogantly and mm -hmm. abusively. Even even the angels don't speak abusively. So dignitaries are not like senators or 
Sure. So I'm going to yeah. leap over a question here and go to Larissa's question that seems okay. <clears throat> similar. How does rebuking Satan work? Do we speak directly to him or to God about him? Sometimes I feel like my rebuke holds no authority because I don't know which way to direct it. There, there's, you know, um, hmm. I, I have a, I have kind of a, a problem with people doing a lot of rebuking of Satan, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have certain passages in the Bible where uh, demons were spoken to directly by Jesus or Paul. Um, and, and yet, I think that Christians have gone way beyond what they should or what is appropriate. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us to rebuke Satan. Well, it tells the, us to resist Satan. Right, and that's exactly what I was going to say, is don't you feel like it's similar to what you just said a minute ago? Unless you had ever heard someone teach you this, just by reading the Bible, I don't know anyone that would come up with the idea, like this is what I'm supposed to do is rebuke Satan. If you merely read the Bible, you would come up with the idea that I'm supposed to resist Satan. Yeah. I mean, Jesus rebuked Satan, but, but, he that, was but he's Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just not a big rebuker. I, I think that we should speak to the Lord, asking God to bind the work of the enemy, right. asking the Lord to go before us and clear the path. I think that's the way to go. I, I personally think that talking to Satan is a mistake. Yeah. Okay. So Anissa said, I understand that only God and an individual know what is truly in the individual's heart. But when one encounters someone who makes it a point to proclaim that they are a Christian and they do not refrain from judging others, even using scripture, but at the same time outwardly behave so contrary to scripture that it's hard to believe they truly have Jesus in their heart. Are those outward behaviors a better indication of the state of their heart? Maybe or maybe not. That's not ours to judge. Mm-hmm. It's not ours to judge. Um, if somebody is claiming to be a believer, but their outward behavior is a contradiction of what they say they believe, then you need to pray for that person. That's kind of the person, you know, that maybe James is talking about when he says someone who's wandered from the truth. So lead them back, bring them back, pray for them. Yeah. Uh, pray that, that their, their lives would be a, a, a better reflection of what they believe in their heart. Mm -hmm. you, you don't know, we don't know what's, what's going on in somebody's heart. And um, sure. we're not, you know, we should, we should care enough to, to pray, mm -hmm. you know. Norman says, Pastor Paul, my understanding is that all men suffer because, all people suffer because of the sins Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden. Why is this? Why did Adam and Eve not <clears throat> suffer alone? Well, because it, it's <laughs> difficult to explain, but Adam and Eve were our representatives. Mm -hmm. They were kind of, in a, in a way, kind of the corporate representatives of, of all of mankind that would come after. Mm -hmm. And they were given perfect uh, you know, environment. They were given everything they needed to mm -hmm. succeed. And they chose not to. And we are the recipients. Why it wasn't just limited to them, you know, the Bible doesn't explain. Yeah. Um, except to say that they are they represented us in the garden just as Jesus represented us on the cross. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we are, we can be just as much the recipients of the blessings of Jesus as we are the curse that Adam and Eve That's brought upon good. us. That's a good way to think about it. Well, that That's does it. it. Those are our <laughs> questions for November and uh, we can uh, invite you at this time to share any other questions you may have so that when we get together for our December Q&A, we can answer your question as well. Feel free to email us at office at ccontario.com or you can go through our website. Um, if you ask a question on YouTube, it's hit or miss. We might see it, <laughs> we might not. So that's not the best place to ask a question. So either email us or go through one of the contact forms on our website at ccontario.com. And uh, that's the, the best way to do it. So, And if you live in a country where you're celebrating Thanksgiving, we just wish you a happy Thanksgiving for this week. Absolutely. And we look forward to the next time when we can be together. Until then, God bless you. Have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.